Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get, get started. Just a couple housekeeping rules. Um, please wait to save your questions for the end. I will be walking around with a microphone. Just hold your hand up in the air, and I will go ahead and bring the microphone because the session is being recorded for you to look back on later and for others who were unable to attend today to look back on. So please welcome our panel. So good afternoon. Thank you for coming to this session. It's adult congenital heart disease, blood disorders, and liver disease in pulmonary hypertension. It's a lot of uh, things that we are going to cover this afternoon. I am uh, very happy to welcome the panelists here. Uh, and we have uh, uh, Dr. Michael Croker. He's a professor of medicine from Mayo Clinic, done a lot of work in liver disease associated pulmonary hypertension. He's going to uh, talk about that. Dr. Murali Chakinala, he is Associate Professor of Medicine from WashU. We are happy to have him. He's going to talk about uh, congenital heart disease uh, and its relationship to pulmonary hypertension. And I'm Zina Saftar. Um, I'm the chair of the session. I'm from Houston, uh, which is not far from here. It's like three and a half hour drive, depending on the traffic. It took me five hours. Um, but um, uh, so I'm the director of the PH program there, and I'm going to talk about um, the blood disorders associated with pulmonary hypertension. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? yeah. Okay, good. Good. All right. So, Dr. Koka. Well, thank you very much. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting in on a patient support group meeting earlier, and a few of you were there, and it was very enlightening regarding the questions and the, and the issues. So. Uh, I want to talk about uh, pulmonary hypertension and, and liver disease, uh, particularly um, we're dealing with this problem in the liver transplant community. But there's a lot of patients who are not going to have a liver transplant that have liver issues, so this uh, spans a pretty big spectrum. There really are, are three types of pulmonary hypertension that we're dealing with primarily in liver disease. One is a high flow state. Any patient with liver disease that's advanced, they have dilated blood vessels in the belly, and it's due to the fact that the liver is not functioning correctly, and, and there's obstruction to flow in, in, in the liver. You can't hear that? We can hear anything. We this How about how about that one? There you go. Ah, all right. We'll, we'll start all over. All right, so we've got three, three different types of pulmonary hypertension involved with patients with advanced liver disease. The reason uh, for this is primarily when the liver doesn't work, the blood vessels in the belly um, uh, around the bowel, they dilate and they, they can cause a variety of problems. The first problem is that sets the patient up for a high flow state. In other words, the cardiac output, uh, heartbeats per minute, the amount of blood that's being generated by the heart every minute is very high, higher than normal. So that's a high flow state and that causes the pressure to go up and the pressure goes up in the blood vessels of the lungs. There's nothing wrong with the blood vessels in the lungs. It's just high flow. The second thing that happens in patients with liver disease is they retain fluid, and they do that because, again, the liver doesn't function well or the kidneys don't function well, diet is not uh, appropriate, there's a lot of different issues, and we've got too much blood in the blood vessels. Again, there's nothing wrong with the blood vessels per se, it's just that there's volume excess. And the third problem is truly a blood vessel problem. Uh, we don't know exactly what the, what the mediators are, but because the liver doesn't function, it may not clear bad substances out of the blood. That blood goes through the liver or bypasses the liver, and where does it go next? It goes to the lungs, and it affects the blood vessels of the lungs, causes the blood vessels of the lungs to constrict, and there's an obstruction to blood flow. And it's not just constriction, there's actually a proliferation of the cells that actually contribute to the obstruction of the flow. And then you have what we call pulmonary artery hypertension associated with liver disease or portopulmonary hypertension. So those are the big three. The most common one is the high flow state. You can have combinations of all three of these too, and that makes it 
confusing for the physicians sometimes to figure out what's going on. The real uh, issue here is what should be treated with these medications that we all have to treat pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and the first two, high flow and excess volume, you generally do not use these medicines. You use these medicines to treat the portal pulmonary hypertension. And we can talk about uh, the goals in, in a little bit. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is that what liver disorders cause this? Well, any liver disorder that causes uh, advanced liver disease can, can be responsible. We think that maybe, maybe autoimmune type liver diseases, PBC, primary biliary cirrhosis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, autoimmune hepatitis may be more frequent and may be more difficult to treat. That's a maybe, so we're, we're thinking about that. The treatment options, uh, any of the medications that have been approved for group one pulmonary hypertension have been used to treat portal pulmonary hypertension. Many of these medications uh, have been studied for every disorder except portal pulmonary hypertension, but we still use the medicines because they work. And there is one prospective study ongoing right now with one of the endothelin receptor antagonists, Massutantin, uh, Upsummit, and, and that is currently being developed, and that's only for portal pulmonary hypertension patients. So that's being done in Europe, and it's being done uh, in the United States. So your physicians may use any of these medications alone or in combination, and that's, that's certainly fair game, and it's, it's, uh, it's acceptable because portal pulmonary hypertension is considered to be a group one, uh, group one problem. Uh, what should the drug be that is used? That's up to your physicians. That's up to the individual situation. There is no recipe that's good for everyone. There are side effects to these drugs, especially when you have liver disease, and so everything has to be done very, very carefully. Finally, uh, one of the main uh, issues that we deal with is what if the patient needs a liver transplant and has portal pulmonary hypertension? Is that allowable? It depends on how well the portal pulmonary hypertension is treated. You have to treat it and get it into an acceptable state. And by that I mean the pressure comes down, but you also have a good functioning right ventricle uh, to allow an operation to be done successfully. In the early days, patients were being sent to the operating room with a, for a liver transplant. The diagnosis was not made or it was made in the OR, and it was made in the OR about 65% of the time. That was the first time people were seeing this diagnosis. And there were several intraoperative deaths from right heart failure. And that's just a horrible situation, as you can imagine. So we're very, very cautious now. There's over 6,000 liver transplants done a year, about 18,000 people on the wait list. Probably 5 to 10 percent of those individuals would have significant portal pulmonary <clears throat> hypertension. So every liver transplant center in the United States and Europe screens for pulmonary hypertension, and the diagnosis of portal pulmonary hypertension is made by a right heart catheterization. And that gives you a very accurate picture of exactly which one of those three or a combination of those three type things are ongoing. So that's my little spiel. Happy to uh, answer some questions. And, um, so can I ask one question? Yes. How do you screen for, how do you screen for portal pulmonary hypertension? The screening for portal pulmonary hypertension is a basic uh, echocardiogram, a transthoracic echocardiogram that your pulmonologist or cardiologist can do. And we look for evidence of two things. Number one, we look for an increased right ventricular systolic pressure, and every center has their own criteria as to what the next step should be. At the Mayo Clinic, if that pressure is higher than 50, normal should be 25 to 30 or below. If that pressure is 50 or above, that patient goes to a right heart catheterization. The second consideration would be if the right ventricle looks big, or doesn't look like it's squeezing well, despite the pressure being okay, that patient goes to have a right heart cath. So those are the two things we do at our institution, and those criteria are, are flexible depending on, on the place just doing the studies. 
my pH was caused by my liver. Um, now my doctor seems to think if I have, if I get my, my pressures are about 40 right now, they want them to come down, I'm on three medications, 10, you know, to 30, and then I can go on a list supposedly. What is the, the percentage of, because he seems to think within three months after a transplantation, I will be cured. <clears throat> I don't, you know, and what I've read on the internet doesn't happen that way. Right. In, in patients that are being seen in transplant centers that are being considered seriously for a, a transplant, and if their pressures are high, the working, uh, the working guidelines right now are that no patient will go on to a transplant if, those, if the mean pulmonary artery pressure measured by right heart cath is 50 or higher. That's a contraindication to transplant. Ideally, you wish to get the pressures, the mean pulmonary artery pressure below 35. And if you do, you can get a higher priority for a liver transplant by what they call the MELD exception, model for end stage liver disease exception. If you can get the mean pulmonary artery pressure less than 35. Keep in mind, when you do the screening echo, you're not looking at mean pressures, you're looking at the systolic pressure. So this is why you have to do a right heart cath. If you get the pressure below 35, then you can be considered for a MELD exception, and every three months they got to repeat the right heart cath, and we're hoping to change that policy soon, so you don't have to do that sequentially. It's quite painful. It's very, yes. no, it's risky stuff, too. You know, you got a yes. platelet count that's low, you got an INR that's high, you got to give all these things before a right heart cath. You don't want to be doing that all the time. So let's say they get your pressures down below 35. Let's say you go to the operating room. In the operating room, again, they will put in a pulmonary artery catheter to double check to make sure everything is okay, and if the pressures are uh, all right, you'll proceed. I still tell the patients they are at higher risk for a liver transplant just because they have the portal pulmonary hypertension, even if we have it under good control, even if the right ventricle looks good now and the functioning is good. You get through the operation, you get through the intensive care unit part. What percentage of those people are going to come off all of these medicines? That's the big question. That's what is being looked at right now. But roughly, it's very institution dependent. At our place, if you can get the pressures looking good before the transplant and the right ventricle looks normal size, normal function, 50% of them will come off the medicine. 50 other, the other 50% will not. Now that's, that's in our hands, and I don't know what it could be at some of the other places because there's not a lot of data out there, but we are in the process of collecting that. So the answer is yes, it's curable in some people. Who are the 50% that we maybe can't cure and are going to still stay on medicines? We can't prove it yet, but we think it may be those that have the autoimmune liver diseases, the primary biliary cirrhosis, the PSC, the autoimmune. The alcoholics seem to do well, get them through. The NASH patients seem to do well, get them through. The hepatitis C patients, you know. But again, they're always going to be, patients will always be at risk for the transplant procedure itself. The stuff that happens, you just cannot, I can tell you, you just cannot predict. Thank you. Yeah. So at our institution, we do a fair amount of liver uh, transplant uh, in patients uh, who we get the pressures under control after portopulmonary, and our data is exactly the same. 50%, 50 to 60% of patients get off the medicine right away. Some of the patients uh, take a longer time, up to six months to a year, and we slowly taper them down. And then we looked at the data on those patients that we did get them off how many of them stayed off five years down the road. So 50% stayed off, and 50% had to go back on the medicine. So we published that recently. Yeah, and, and I think, again, you know, not any one institution doesn't have, you know, hundreds of patients we're talking about. I mean, there's just not, not that many. The last study, I think, that they did from, uh, from University of Pennsylvania, they, uh, they looked at uh, roughly about 100 patients that had been transplanted, and that came from UNOS. And a lot of those patients were inappropriately categorized, so the number they thought they had 
was much less than the number that they eventually studied. And those patients, you had no idea what they're on. You just know that they got meld exception for portal pulmonary hypertension and there were some outcomes. That's not acceptable anymore. We need to know exactly what people are doing. At my place, if you ask me what, what, you, what are you using to treat, I like an ERA and I like, I like the ambrosantin, mainly because we have a lot of experience with that. And if I have someone that really needs to be treated more aggressively, I will go to an intravenous prostacycline, such as epiprostenol, again, because we have a lot of experience with that. So that's my, that's my double header two combo if I really need something. And I like to have an IV prep during the OR and continue the uh, oral. And then after that, I try to get them off the IV preparation several weeks later the, and leave them on the oral and then modify the oral if I can. Can't always, can't always do that. And then there are an occasional rare bird who they don't even have portal pulmonary hypertension that you can document before their transplant, but voila, four months, six months, eight months later, they present with shortness of breath and they've got full-blown pulmonary artery hypertension and we don't know why that happens, but that's a tough that's a tough one to treat too but it that does happen my first question is um, since this particular session is uh, both like heart transplant and the congenital uh, with the blood disorder whatever what is the common ground that you put those two looks like a different category in the same session first of all uh, except PS, of course, both are pH. But if I hear you just talk about the mean PAP, which is less than 35, right, something, to be normal in, in her condition, right, 35 and above. In my particular case, I'm in, I'm in like more than 70 mean PAP. Peak is like 100 something, whatever. So uh, what I'm a little confused is what is the boundary for a real P is what exactly is, is I know mostly it's uh, mostly we say 35 and above is pH right so but some are like 36 37 is kind of severe and some people like me I still feel myself like strong enough not really having any disease or something even though my pap those numbers looks like uh, more than 100 peak uh, 110 15 something and then the average is like this, average is, I mean, PAP is like 80, 70 to 80, something so, like that. So, so hold, hold that thought. It's a, it's a good question. Um, we're just going to try to uh, tackle the liver disease questions right now because Dr. Kroka has a, yes. has a flight but, to yeah. catch. I, I think one, one thing I could just yeah. say, just yeah. why I think the unifying thing you're asking how these sessions are put mm -hmm. together, each of these entities pulmonary hypertension is not very straightforward. There's different ways you can get pulmonary hypertension and pay all the patients, whether you have a blood disorder, congenital heart disease, or liver disease, they can have some common problems. They, there's issues of increased flow, as Dr. Krauka mentioned, liver patients can get, patients with congenital heart disease, uh, sickle cell patients can get increased flow. And the, because you can get pulmonary hypertension for various reasons in, in, any, in one condition, it's really important they have a thorough evaluation, including a heart catheterization. Probably more important in these three disorders than anything else, like in idiopathic and, and, and the scleroderma, for instance. Yeah, it's really complex physi physiology here, and that's why I think these are linked together. And let me answer your other question. The one you said about the mean pulmonary artery pressure. So the diagnosis of PAH is when the mean PAP is more than 25. But just for the liver transplant uh, uh, to be um, qualified to undergo a liver transplant, the mean PAP in, only in those patients have to be less than 35 to decrease the risk of bleeding during the transplant also to be able to take the, the liver that is going to be given to them. So that's why a little bit of confusion there for you. Yeah. And this issue of severity of your condition <coughs> and how you feel, there's, there's clearly a discordancy between what your pressure is and how you feel. You, it's not the PA pressure that determines how you feel. The PA pressure helps make a diagnosis. But how you feel is entirely dependent on how well the right side of your heart is contending with those pressures. I have a lady who has a PA systolic pressure over 140 for 10 years and feels fantastic. 
but we all have patients who have a PA pressure of 50 who are, you know, in horrible shape. And that's because that second patient, the right ventricle is so weak, it can't generate enough blood flow and force to mount a higher PA pressure. So just knowing the pressure doesn't tell us anything about how well or poorly someone is doing. It's really the heart function, and that's where the echo and the heart cath in particular and telling us measures like cardiac output, the amount of blood flowing and the right atrial pressure, how much pressure is backing up from the lungs into the heart. Those are the things that are more telling of how someone is doing than just knowing what the PA systolic or mean PA pressure is. We, we've all seen Thank patients in our centers now that are sent to us uh, and the diagnosis is made uh, only by, uh, a pres uh, by an echo and, and many times that's inaccurate. It's just not complete, and, and the diagnosis is modified, and the treatment is modified by actually doing the right heart catheterization and learning more detail rather than just what an echo shows. And remember, echoes all over the country and all over the institutions are very operator dependent, depending on how they aim those transducers. So it's not at all uncommon to go to the other centers of excellence and have the echoes repeated so you know exactly what's going on. So a lot of, vari a lot of variability out there. But with Thank God. taking no, but with taking all of these meds, and can I develop a, a liver problem? Well, a lot of the liver problems that people that we're seeing now are are different from the problems we were seeing 15 and 20 years ago. So, for example, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFTL. This is a relatively new problem that, that adults get later on related to a variety of factors. Diet, weight, certainly that's an issue. Hepatitis C. People can get hepatitis C. They have no idea how they got it. They weren't drug users. They, they weren't doing anything like that. And they got hepatitis C. The autoimmunes generally have, have been there, um, maybe not recognizable. Alcoholic cirrhosis, for example. I mean, could you get that as a, as a, as an adult in middle? Well, sure you can. So yes, these things can happen. And then yes, you could get portopulmonary hypertension uh, along with that. They generally, the liver disease generally precedes from what we know the portopulmonary hypertension by many months or years. So that's pretty much a given. You don't get both of them at, at the same time from, from what we've seen. So you are at risk. Pardon? I think she's asking, is there a drug potential or pH? As long as you don't drink oh, and no, the I, I mean, stuff. Yeah, dr the drugs per se, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not aware of any of our drugs causing, uh, causing portal hypertension or cirrhosis. Uh, now, having said that, the Bosantin or Traclear can affect liver enzymes, uh, so your doctors have to be careful about that. And but but they've, I've not seen any patient with our current drugs that have gotten into big trouble with uh, liver issues. Hasn't happened. Okay, so moving right along. Yeah, so we'll shift gears. And first, let me say thank you for coming. Uh, this, this is always, personally for me, the highlight of this whole conference is to sit down and talk to you guys about this on a more personal level here. Um, so I was charged with talking about congenital heart disease. Can I just see a show of hands? How many of here in this room are either because they, their pH or, or their, whoever they're here with, their loved one, has pH related to congenital heart disease? So quite a few of you, okay. So this is a huge topic in itself, and it's getting to be a bigger and bigger topic because, you know, all of us are adult doctors, but our friends in pediatrics have been doing a phenomenal job, um, you know, diagnosing, detecting, and managing kids and young adults when, or, you know, teenagers who have these problems that they're born with, and, and they're making it into adulthood. It's a, actually a very pleasant problem for us because in the past, um, a, a lot of people born with congenital heart uh, defects never made it to adulthood. Um, so it's something that we as adults 
adult physicians are seeing more and more of, either the kids are graduating to be adults and come to us, or sometimes we're just finding it late because we're better at looking for some of the defects. The echo machines have gotten so good, cardiac MRIs, even chest CTs pick up uh, various defects and I can guarantee you there were people 20 years ago that were diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension that probably had congenital heart uh, disease and it was just missed a long time ago. Um, so it's a very big topic, it's a growing population um, and what we mean by congenital heart disease is you have to understand a little basic <clears throat> physiology that there is even though we talk about one organ in the heart, the heart really is sort of two different organs sitting side by side. There's the right side of the heart and there's the left side of the heart. We in the pH community focus so heavily on the right side of the heart because that's the one that suffers from the pulmonary hypertension. It's got to pump the blood uh, through this d damaged uh, blood vessels and the high pressure and that right heart fails. And then, but in, in normally, that right side of the heart or the right circulation and the left circulation are two separate entities or processes and I tell patients it's like a relay race okay it's like imagine yourself a, 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 a relay race with a baton that one person runs the lap and hands off the baton to the next person well the same thing here the left side of the heart pumps blood out and it comes to, to all over the body it comes back to the heart to the right side and it's like the batons being handed off to the right side now and then that pumps the blood to through the lungs well, those two circulations shouldn't intermingle. There shouldn't be any crossover of blood in the heart. But some patients or some people are born with defects at different levels of the heart. It could be in the top of the heart called the, an atrial septal defect, in the bottom part of the heart called a ventricular septal defect. It could involve both parts, what we call an AV canal defect. It could even be outside of the heart in some of the big blood vessels that are coming out of the heart. There's all kinds of ways, and it really doesn't matter that much the defect for our purposes, but the point is that the left and right side that I was just talking about really need to be separated. The blood intermixes either in the heart or right outside the heart. And as a result, because the pressure in the left side of the, circ the left circulation is really high, you now can have the situation where high pressure and extra blood is now being sent through the right side and through the lungs. Okay? And that's what we mean by a congenital heart defect or a shunt. So there's a lot of people with those kind of problems. Some of them go on to develop pulmonary arterial hypertension. In some people, even with that abnormal connection, all it means is there's extra blood flowing through the system, kind of like in the liver patients, now you have a higher flow system. But the lungs seem to ignore it, they don't react in any adverse way, and if you find the defect, you can typically just fix it and, and the, everything goes away in, in those situations. But then there's a smaller percentage of patients who develop a problem, that extra flow and perhaps that pressure that's building up in the right side inflicts injury into the blood vessels of the lungs, just like a scleroderma patient has injury to the blood vessels of the lungs, or if someone who took FenFen might have injury to the blood vessels of the lungs. Well, here it's this extra flow and pressure from the blood going from the left side to the right side that it's inflicting an injury to the blood vessels in the lungs. And what can happen is eventually the pressure in the lungs goes really high, so high that now the pressure is higher on the right side and blood actually through the the, through the hole or defect goes in the wrong direction. Instead of from the left side to the right side, it's going from the right side to the left side. And we call that Eisenmenger syndrome, and that's really the extreme form. Thankfully, only a minority of patients get Eisenmenger syndrome. Okay? So if you have one of these problems, it's very important that, again, just like what Dr. Krauka mentioned with the liver patients, you have to have a thorough evaluation by someone who really understands the anatomy and physiology. And you have to figure out if that individual patient, where on the spectrum are they? Is it still early and it's all just a, a left to right system that if you fix the hole or fix the defect, everything goes away? Or is it gone too far and now it's a non-surgical or non-corrective situation 
and do we have to treat with medications? And thankfully, many of the pH medications that we use all, you know, all uh, in some shape or form, the 14 that are out there have been tried in patients with, uh, you know, even the Eisenmenger syndrome. And there's been at least one uh, clinical trial that showed a benefit and it was safe to use these drugs in Eisenmenger's patients. And we have another study that's ongoing right now with a different drug, OpSummit, which is being looked at specifically in Eisenmenger's and Menger's patients as well, too. So we have to figure out if you're in that rare group of patients where the damage has been done to the blood vessels, it's gone beyond just the extra flow through the, through the hole, and whether we need to treat with medical therapy. The last point I would just make before I take any questions is, that, well, what if you're one of those people where when we find it, the pressures are already high enough that we feel like it's too risky to close maybe the defect of the hole, but maybe you're not all the way to Eisenmenger's yet. Could you treat medically and then maybe go back and, and repair the defect? And that's, this is an area, it's a little bit controversial, but we're gaining more and more experience. Our own center published our experience on this a few years ago, and we just had um, 15 patients that when we diagnosed them with, uh, the whole, uh, with the defect and the pH was considered too severe to fix it, we treated them with various drugs like the ERAs, PD-5 inhibitors and whatnot, and then over about a, an average of a year span, a, a third of those patients improved enough that we could close them safely, and it, very interestingly, those patients actually got even better after they closed the defect, but we have to keep treating them medically. And our experience has only grown over time that I think that even patients who when we find it and we think it's too far past uh, repairing or closing, that there's a chance that with aggressive treatment that we can reverse the clock enough to close the hole and still maybe benefit patients. So I've, I've given you a lot of information, a lot of complex physiologic points that even a lot of our colleagues don't understand. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions now, or do you want to wait, Zenot, until you do your part? Do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm just going to give you a microphone. Second, sorry. So what percentage of congenital heart disorder um, patients develop pulmonary hypertension, and of those, which one, how many does it develop the Eisenmenger syndrome? That's a good question. So there's been some nice large registries, mainly out of Europe, that have tried to answer some of these questions. Uh, some of these questions. Um, the, 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 the likelihood of developing PAH and going all the way to Eisenmenger's uh, does depend on what the defect is. The three most common defects are what's called a ventricular septal defect, an AV canal defect, or a patent ductus arteriosus. Um, atrial septal defects, it's a smaller percentage, but it's not that uncommon just because ASDs are fairly common. And the best answer I can give you is that of the patients with congenital heart disease who have the type of defects that might cause PAH, about 10% go on to develop PAH. But within each of those specific defects, it varies. For instance, VSDs, it's thought to be about 50%, or ASDs, it's really more like around 6% go on to develop PAH. The Eisenmenger number is going to be even lower than that, Just and I, and I don't know if I can give you a firm number. And as these patients are living longer over a period of time, you're seeing more and more of these complications. And the treatments that we have available for these patients uh, right now help them to live, make it to adult life, and even 50s and 60s. So we have quite patients who are, you know, have led a full life given that they, what they were born with. It's interesting that not everybody who has a defect develops the disease, so there are different theories out there. Why would, you know, if, if the defect is the cause of the disease, then everybody should get it, right? Everybody should develop pulmonary hypertension, but that is not the case, so there are, there are some interesting theories out there. If you uh, have the Eisenmenger syndrome and you treat with these medications, what, what happens to the patient's oxygen levels? What do you expect? to happen with the oxygen levels? Yeah, that's a good question. So the reason patients who have, you know, like a VSD or an ASD, uh, a big part of why they're so low in oxygen is because uh, blood from the right side of the heart, which is low in oxygen, mixes 
through that hole uh, that you, or the defect with the blood on the left side of the heart that is full of oxygen. And that mixing of blood winds up lowering oxygen levels so that when we check the pulse oximeter, your, pressure, your pulse ox may be 80% or 78%. So if we did something that on balance decreased the amount of blood going right to left, okay, follow me, so that now maybe there's a greater balance of the blood going left to right, your oxygen levels should get better. And we, we do see that in our patients. In fact, that's, it's actually kind of a nice way, another way for us in clinic to follow and assess patients um, once we start drug therapy, if they have Eisenmengers or a, a shunt where there's a mixing of blood both directions. Um, it, we often see sats come up very nicely, you know, resting saturations come up very nicely, uh, giving us a easy reproducible biomarker, as we call it, telling us, hey, look at that, this patient is getting better. So usually you do a six minute walk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the world famous six minute walk, right? <laughs> All of you love it, right? Yes? Uh uh. Right. <laughs> so that tells us that, you know, if the oxygenation is getting better. And if your oxygenation really gets better and, and your, your shunt, the, the flow across, um, uh, gets better, then you may be a candidate or patient is a candidate for closure. And that, mm -hmm. that is the curative surgery, yeah. wouldn't you agree? Yeah, in fact, in our, in our case series that we published, the, 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 the change in the oxygen saturation during the six minute walk that D Dr. Zaftar mentioned, um, the patients who had, after starting drug therapy, who had the most improvement in how, you know, in how much the oxygen saturations dropped during the six minute walk, they're the ones whose the resistance in the, in the blood, in the lungs, the blood vessel resistance or pulmonary vascular resistance improved the most and they were the ones who could get closed. So we actually, even though you hate the six minute walk doing it, there's a lot of useful information in a six minute walk, especially in patients with congenital heart disease. We learn, uh, number one, you can walk farther so that, you know, that's a clue that you're feeling better. Your resting saturation can improve, suggesting you're doing better. And what I'm telling you is that the saturation at the end of the walk, you know, what that level is after drug therapy versus what it was at the beginning might even give us a clue that, hey, you may have improved enough that we might actually be able to close your defect. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A quick question regarding the saturation. Um, in six minutes, in a six minute walk, uh, we can, I mean, personally, I can easily cross 400 or, you know, like high number, but the saturation goes down to 70s or even 60s and a little bit short of breath, of course, but I don't really feel that much, you know, yeah. as the number shows, you yeah. know, no, and my nerves get scared, you know, you're too low, no, wait, wait. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I can walk. Yeah. And that's one thing. And the other thing about the, I have Eisenman syndrome also, by the way. And uh, I, uh, you know, try to find the articles, of course, you know, what you have, I try to learn myself. And I read one of the articles from, I think, Italian group, something, which, which, which says uh, pH with Eisenman syndrome have longer life expectancy compared to without not having as a center. So can you please explain that in detail whether that was right or something if you Yeah, the the oxygen issue is really a complicated concept I think for patients to understand. We all know oxygen is important. It's vital. I mean it's it's the in essence of life you have to have oxygen. The problem or the, the challenge to understand here is that there are different ways people's oxygen levels can get low in pulmonary hypertension. Um, it could be low because the oxygen levels in the lungs are low. It could be low because the oxygen level returning to the heart from going all over the body is so low, especially if you're in a very weakened state. And in, in patients with Eisenmengers, it can be low because of that mixing of blood in the heart through the hole in there. And it doesn't matter how much oxygen you pump into the nose, into the lungs in Eisenmengers, because that oxygen that you breathe into the lungs is not going to help 
uh, uh, the oxygen that's skipping the lungs altogether and going from one side of the heart to the other side. So I am not at all surprised to hear you say that you feel fine even when your SATs get down into the 60% range. The reason is, even though your SATs are low, that hole allows you to pump blood from the right side to the left side and get it all over your body, even though it's low in oxygen, there's still what we call the overall oxygen delivery, not a saturation, but the amount of oxygen is actually enhanced by having that hole. And we think that's a big reason why patients with Eisenmengers live a lot longer than say someone, you know, the life expectancy is pretty good compared to someone who was diagnosed with IPAH in their 20s or something. It's partly that, partly it's also just that your heart is stronger to deal with the high pressures because it's been like this most of, not all your life. So it's complex reasons, but I personally don't get too worried about treating the low oxygen when you have Eisenmengers or these kind of shunts. Again, I look at the saturations because it might tell me how you're doing, but as far as treating you with oxygen, I, I don't get too bent out of shape about it. And I certainly, I've educated my th th therapist, don't stop them from doing their walk just because their sat's low. If they feel fine, let them walk. I want to see what they can do. Okay. Yes, um, a different question <laughs> from the first one. Not so complicated, hopefully. Um, I was at the Cleveland Clinic and they thought I had a hole in my heart and um, did the bubble test to see if the bubbles, I did not. But what I had, they told me was called a mobile atrial septal aneurysm. So it closed on its own. Now, is that something that could still cause an issue on the blood flow from right to left or do you know? No, just having the aneurysm by itself wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Now, you're right that aneurysms often can be associated with other things like something called a patent foramen ovale, which is a little hole that can open up in a lot of PAH patients, but that is not the cause of pulmonary hypertension. And, and just having an atrial septal aneurysm shouldn't be, a, as far as we know, a concern to your PAH. Do you agree, Zena? Yeah, for sure. You just have to be uh, careful that you follow up with your physician, and if they suggest any blood thinners, you make sure you take them. Um, I had a ventricular septal defect repaired when I was five years old in 1962, so it was way on the early edge of stuff. You're giving your age away, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm 59. And um, I've got... I was diagnosed three years ago, finally, with um, PAH, and I seem to be doing well on um, Tyveso and um, oh, uh, Vi Viagra, I can't, Sildenafil. Mm -hmm. um, but when they did my, um, I've had like five right heart casts because studies I'm in, um, and on like my um, Last echo, they showed a peak, a uh, restrictive outlet VSD of uh, with 4.8 meter per second flow, and I'm not sure if my doctors are. I'm I'm afraid I might be going into isomingers. I don't know what what it is, or I don't know. I've been reading enough to get concerned, but I'm not sure. I still have a hole in my heart. Yeah. Uh, and they say it can be good for me because it could be relieving pressure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then they just left it at that. And yeah. I don't know if I need to talk to other people to have all my stuff looked yeah. at to think if I need to go somewhere else, yeah. you know, some other yeah. treatments. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a tough question for us to answer without... Oh, matter. no, I know. I don't want yeah. to... I'm just saying, is it, is it something I should pursue? Yeah, I, I think it would be... I, I don't... You know, I think it's a good idea, it's someone with a complicated situation like that, to be evaluated at a pH center, right. especially a center that has someone with congenital heart disease experience as well. And right now, I'm at OHSU in Oregon mm -hmm. with Dr. Kahn, and, but, but they're not a full PAH center, right. so I should probably be heading to one of... I think it would be a good idea to get a, a second opinion from a PAH center. Um, I don't know the folks there, but I think right. it's very reasonable to do that. And what which center would I... I mean, because I'm going to have... Maybe you can discuss it after the... No, 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 no,
because he'll be biased to tell me, tell you to come to see me because, you know, he's my friend, so. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was you, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> or, or to him, right, himself. You wanted to tackle the, uh, sure. the blood, blood right. disorders? Okay, so we, the last topic, yes, ma'am. Ten minutes. All right. So, uh, who has sickle cell? Anybody? Any patients here has sickle cell disease? Oh, okay. Any of the caregivers or patients have thalassemia? Okay, great. So we have one of each. Excellent. So, um, just for the uh, sake of everybody else, I'm sure you know you, your disease a lot and you read about it. What happens in in, in blood disorders is normally the blood circulates and uh, the hemoglobin is, is inside the red blood cells. I don't know how many of you remember the biology. Yeah, you know, my kids say it's, it's too boring, but anyways. <laughs> uh, so the hemoglobin inside the, the blood, you know, RBC, red blood corpuscles. And in sickle cell what happens is that in the presence of low oxygen, right, in the lungs, uh, the, the, the blood cells become stiff. And when they become stiff, you know, imagine, you know, a normal RBC happy coming along in the, in the vessels. The vessel gets narrower and the RBC kind of conforms to the shape and twists and turns and goes through happily. And now here comes sickling, which is the rigidness of the vessel wall or the RBCs that it, when it comes through the vessel, it kind of uh, breaks down because it can't, you know, bend uh, in these vessels. And when that happens, the uh, hemoglobin which is inside the RBCs comes out. And when that happens, the hemoglobin uh, in the <coughs> blood uh, vessels uh, damages the endothelial cells or lining of these vessels. And uh, these patients then uh, get these painful crises and, um, and cause uh, that can lead over a period of time to pulmonary hypertension. Now the kinds of diseases that patients can have or types of pulmonary hypertension that these patients can have can be related to their heart problems because there's a, they're anemic. There's a lot of uh, decreased uh, blood count in these patients. There is a decreased uh, hemoglobin. There is decreased uh, oxygenation. And they can have uh, the amount of patients that have pulmonary arterial hypertension is, is, is very uh, rare. Most of these patients have diastolic dysfunction of left heart disease. Um, and they can have hypoxemia, and they can have sleep apnea, they can have hypoxic vasoconstriction. So when these patients develop uh, um, uh, sickling and uh, hypoxemia, then uh, these patients, uh, you wanna go on? Go ahead. Go ahead. You're good. All yeah. right. Okay. Then these patients uh, can develop pulmonary hypertension. So the, one of the best screening tools is the echocardiogram uh, to uh, test these patients. But the confirmatory tool uh, for these patients is a right heart cat. Okay. So all of you, both of you, did you have a right heart cat? So, um, you know, the, we talked about liver disease and we talked about uh, the hyperdynamic state. A lot of these patients also with sickle cell also have, and thalassemia have, have a hyperdynamic state in which because of the low blood count and low oxygenation, the, the body tries to compensate for it and pump harder. So they may have an increased cardiac output. All right, so the, the treatment for these patients uh, or patients with sickle cell or any of the blood disorders is to correct hypoxemia, the low oxygen in this. So you might see these video of physicians telling you, okay, you have to use oxygen, especially if you go into the hospital with a crisis. You have to use oxygen, and even at night you need to use oxygen. If you have um, sleep apnea, that can cause low oxygenation at night especially. So a sleep study is also required. Um, a lot of patients with sickling that happens or destruction of the hemoglobin in the blood, they can have restrictive lung disease or lung problems, uh, and that can also lead to problems and pulmonary hypertension related to lung disease itself. The heart itself also can get destroyed over a period of time or get damaged because of sickling. Um, it can lead to left heart problems, which is you know, diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction in, in normal term. If you're EF, LVEF, everybody understands that, you know? So LV ejection fraction can be low. 
normal is what 50, 60, 70 is normal. It can go down to 20 or 30 percent. And that is a different cause uh, that has to be treated differently. In some other patients, it can lead to diastolic dysfunction. Uh, that's the LV becoming stiffer and cannot pump properly. So that's another cause. Now, for, uh, for sickle cell, there was a study that they did looking at sildenafil in, in patients with uh, sickle cell anemia as a, as a, as a treatment of uh, a pulmonary hypertension. And that study was stopped by FDA because a lot of pain, painful crisis and chest crisis in these patients. So sildenafil was associated with increased sickling or increased painful crisis that was stopped. We were using sildenafil in patients with sickle cell and that's, that's a, uh, that is contraindication for that. It's not uh, a, a drug that is uh, used anymore. Now in terms of thalassemia, um, there is no, again, pH-specific medication that's used. Um, the, the oxygen is one that is given uh, if needed. Uh, the other thing is treat the anemia, uh, blood transfusion. But if you have too many blood transfusions, you're going to have an iron straw buildup in the body. And if that happens, you have to have collagen uh, agents that's used. Hydroxyurea is, a, is, is one of the medicines that's used, and that's been shown to be beneficial in thalassemia patients. So that's uh, Let's see about if there's it. any questions any in the last questions couple of minutes. that you have? Yes. Well, I may get this story a little messed up. Because uh, recently, my, well, my wife has had pulmonary hypertension for 17 years and uh, declared it's idiopathic that entire time and just recently had a CT scan you know, of the heart that showed uh, sinus venosis with an atrial septal defect with anomalous venous return. I believe, uh, and this is where I'm, I'm either right or wrong, Eisenmanger's complex, I, I believe, uh, is the case uh, because I, I believe we were told that she does have a, a right to left mm -hmm. shunt. Mm -hmm. uh, anything uh, from a surgical standpoint or leave her alone, her pressures have never changed, she's on all the medicines, all the, yeah. the different uh, classes and uh, maintains a pressure around 100. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you came in late, but you, you're beautifully making the point I was just saying earlier that I think because of advances in imaging, we are able now to find some defects that we were missing probably before. And obviously in the last 17 years, you didn't develop this anomalous pulmonary vein return and this sinus venosis defect. It was probably just missed or the technology or the studies that were done back then didn't pick it up. Um, and, and this is one of the defects, the combination of, an, you have really two defects. You have a hole in the heart and you have an abnormal uh, return of blood from the lungs to the heart. And it's that combination together that can lead to that Eisenmenger's syndrome that we talked about. And really, if, you know, un unless the Eisenmenger's reverses with therapy, you're not going to operate and, and fix it now. And so, it, you know, I have several patients like yourself who, um, you know, they're doing well on medical therapy and, and will continue medical therapy. You have to also balance the risks of surgery, your age, your other medical problems and all of that as well too. Um, so I think that uh, um, if you're doing well on medical therapy, then, uh, you know, that may be what your doctors are going to tell you. You're going to just need to keep taking, uh, whether it can ever be closed or repaired or not. That's something we can't answer today, but, but there are others like you out there. So, so we have exactly to what uh, Dr. Chakanala mentioned. We are seeing more and more of these anomalies now. So I have a patient that was another program came to us and, you know, I did the right heart cat on that patient and something was not quite right. So I said, you know, let's do an MRI, a cardiac MRI, and she does have a anomalous venous return. So the question then comes, should we close it? The only reason to close it if it's going to cure your pulmonary hypertension, you know, that your pulmonary hypertension is because of that increased flow through your lungs. And if it is not uh, in because of increased flow through your lungs, that is fixed uh, problems in your lungs, so it's not reversible anymore, then closing your defect, putting you through this major operation when somebody cracks open the chest and goes in and fix it, but it's not going to fix your pulmonary hypertension, then the risk outweighs the benefit. Mm -hmm. 
So your benefit has to outweigh the risk, you know? So the doctor should be able to tell you, okay, after this operation, there's a high likelihood that your pulmonary hypertension is gonna go away, this oxygen is gonna go away, your medicine is gonna go away. Then you're gonna say, yes, ma'am, I'm gonna go ahead and go and get it. And there are specialists, especially uh, uh, congenital heart disease specialists who can make a complete assessment and tell you whether this is possible or not in conjunction with your pH specialist. And unfortunately, we are out of time today. So I would just want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, please give our panelists a round of applause for thank being you. here. Thank you all for being here.